My name is Greg Krasowski, and this video is about standard procedure that we use to uh, evaluate potential medical malpractice and dangerous drug claims. First of all, people who contact my law offices fall into two categories. One category are individuals who have who may have a viable product liability claim against a drug manufacturer. And generally, that arises when a drug manufacturer fails to warn a patient, fails to warn them adequately and accurately of a particular side effect on the warning label, on the FDA-approved warning label. So if you're a patient who has received a prescription drug and you end up developing a complication, a side effect, uh, that has been scientifically and statistically proven to have been caused, in fact, by that drug. In other words, right, we, need, we need scientific proof, proof from medical experts who are clinicians, who are researchers. Uh, we need statistical proof. In other words, hundreds, thousands of cases, depending on the popularity of the drug. Uh, where a particular pathology or right, a particular medical condition uh, has been confirmed to be caused by that drug. Once you have that, and if that particular medical condition has not been adequately and accurately listed on the warning label, when I mean adequate and accurate, that medical condition has to be listed with a certain level of specificity and it has to be given sufficient attention. That's where the adequacy comes in. For instance, you'll notice that periodically, drug manufacturers end up adding what are called black box warnings to their drugs, where you have text and bold on a warning label with a black box around it. That's a very strong warning to the drug's potential users, to patients. Unfortunately, most patients only get access to the drug label, the FDA-approved drug label, once they pick up the prescription at the pharmacy. As far as we're concerned, that's too late. And keep something in mind as well. When the FDA uh, approves the drug for medical use and approves its drug label, Usually this is a drug under patent, and so the approval is made for the brand name drug and the brand name label. Then a certain particular number of years transpire and the patent rights to the drug are lost, 10 years and so forth. And then generic drug manufacturers step in. And if you look at the biggest generic drug manufacturers, these are huge pharmaceutical plants in countries like India and other countries around the world. You have major generic drug manufacturers. And they, the warning label that accompanies their drug, the generic, is obviously the brand name's warning label. And, and this is why if you've taken a generic and you've come down with a side effect that's been scientifically and statistically proven to have been caused by that drug and wasn't adequately and accurately disclosed on a warning label, but if it's a generic, you have no recourse. You have no cause for legal action because we've had a U.S. Supreme Court decision a while back that stated that, sorry, you can't sue generic drug manufacturers because it's not their warning label that you're relying on. You were relying on the warning label of a brand name manufacturer. So it's not fair to hold the generic manufacturers liable. Uh, and there were only a couple of states that uh, did not go along with that. Uh, and I think California and Alabama, but then you know the pharmaceutical lobby is pretty strong when it comes to lobbying efforts to change things on the legislative level, even on the state level. So the other thing you have to consider is if you may not have a viable dangerous drug claim, product liability claim, uh, that you can assert also within you know, the time parameters established by the statutes of limitations, 
and statute of limitations are different in every state, then you may have a medical malpractice claim. And right now we'll go, we'll go through why. But before we get to that, uh, let, let's talk about statute of limitations and class actions, because everyone always asks me the same thing. What about class actions? What about statutes of limitation? I think class action is a misnomer, because what you end up having is you end up having collective lawsuits that uh, get united in the state court system and sometimes in a federal court system. And why are these collective lawsuits? Because you have patients, individual plaintiffs with similar claims over a particular side effect against a particular drug manufacturer. Uh, as I always tell uh, my prospective clients, remember each case is different. Uh, often patients, you know, why are cases different? Because every patient has their own medical history, different contributing factors that could have contributed to the medical condition. They may also have been on other drugs, which can also cause similar negative side effects and complications. So when you say, hey, is there a class action? Can I get in on it and get paid? Uh, yes, periodically class actions arise. And in those cases, uh, often the judges will treat the statute of limitations differently, both on the state level and the federal level. Because often the statute of limitations will start to toll, will start to tick from um, usually either the day you, a reasonable person could have recognized the particular side effect or the day that, for instance, a black box warning was added or a drug was recalled by the FDA or the day where scientific, you know, sufficient scientific and statistical evidence appeared to show the connection between a particular side effect and the drug in question or the class of drugs. Uh, but you're, if a patient is a layperson, how would you know that? If you're a patient, you're going to be relying on information from your doctor, right? Now, maybe from your pharmacist, but generally from the doctor who prescribed the drug to you. What if the doctor didn't, doesn't put you on notice and say, hey, Jim, by the way, you know, we've just gotten information that the drug that you've been on for a year or two, uh, now it's been established to cause the, the following side effects or create additional risks, for instance, cancer, cancer risk, risk of heart attacks, strokes, uh, other serious medical conditions, blood clots, uh, pulmonary embolism. If that doesn't happen, then what are you to do? So often what will happen is the judges will uh, make a decision in each case from where the statute of limitations should be calculated and whether people should be included. Uh, because they may not have had an opportunity to know. You know, this whole reasonable person test may not apply to them. Um, that, that's the statute of limitations issue. That's the class action issue. Now, moving on to the second type of claims that people approach us with, and these are medical malpractice claims. So generally, medical mal viable medical malpractice claim exists if you've received medical treatment but the medical care provider, whether it's a doctor or a nurse, physician's assistant, uh, or even you know, EMT paramedic, uh, failed to adhere to the generally accepted local standards of care. So well, let's just dissect that. You have generally accepted standards of medical care for each type of medical care professional. So you have certain standards for emergency medical technicians, for paramedics, for other medical technicians. You have certain standards of medical care for nurses, both LPNs and registered nurses, including nurse practitioners who practice fairly independently on their own, although under the supervision of a physician. Same thing with physician's assistants. Uh, and then we take these generally accepted standards of care, and these standards of care are confirmed by state medical boards, are confirmed by medical literature, by medical standards that have been approved by, you know, medical school accrediting bodies and things like that. And then these standards of care are applied locally. 
And the reason why they're applied locally is obviously, excuse me, you're going to have different levels of care, for instance, in a rural clinic in Mississippi or Montana, as opposed to the standards of medical care of a major medical center in uh, Los Angeles or Chicago or New York. Different situations. Uh, but, but that's what we look at. So the interaction with the patient first starts, this is in regard to medical drugs, to prescription drugs. Uh, medical malpractice claims related to prescription drugs, or let's say medical devices. You come to a doctor, he looks at you and he says, well, I think uh, I'm going to treat you with a particular type of drug or a particular type of medical device. It'll be beneficial to you. This is what you need to get better. And you as the patient, you're a lay person, you're going to rely on the doctor's advice. You go, okay, sure. And you get the prescription. You go to the pharmacy. You get the drug package, the pill bottle, along with the warning label. Lots of fine print. Now, how many of you have taken the time to read all the fine print on the warning label. Based on my law office statistics, very low number of people who contact my law offices. How many patients uh, had the following thing happen to them? You go to a doctor, he says, well, Jim, this is the drug that you need. But by the way, here's what you need to be aware of. And the doctor pulls out the warning label, takes a highlighter, Starts marking it up. These are the issues. By the way, keep in mind that, you know, this drug can potentially cause these negative side effects. Chances are relatively well, statistically small. That's why it's FDA approved, because the FDA considered that the benefits outweigh the potential costs of the complications. But you should know anyway, right? Uh, I get calls daily from all around the country. Our intake is massive. And when I ask, or my staff ask prospective patients whether their doctors did that, I can probably count the figures of one hand, the physicians who did that. And that's sad because what the doctors are doing is they're violating the Hippocratic Oath. Remember Hippocrates, the, was the Greek philosopher who's considered to be the father of medicine? Well, one of the things that you're supposed to do under that oath is obtain your patient's fully informed consent. In other words, before you start treating, whether it's doing surgery or diagnostic procedures, x-rays, MRI, CAT scans, blood work, or treating someone with prescription drugs, you're supposed to fully inform your patient so you obtain their genuine consent. And the consent isn't genuine unless the patient receives full information. And full information is on the pros of the treatment, including the prescription drug, and the cons of the treatment. If your physician has failed to do that, then what he has done is he has basically given you medical treatment without your full informed consent. What if he prescribes to you a drug that can have serious side effects, including death, disability, uh, cardiac complications, which means heart attacks, congestive heart failure, myocarditis, right, swelling of the heart tissue, inflammation of the heart tissue. What if it can have serious neurological complications? Imagine this, if you start, if it start developing neuropathy, atrophy of your nerves, or conditions where your nerves seize up, give constant signals to muscles, causing muscles to seize up. We see that with mental health drugs and conditions such as tardive dyskinesia, tardive dystonia. Uh, you could have endocrine complications, strokes, Blood clots, as I mentioned before. 
and what's liver failure, liver damage, kidney damage. I mean, these are serious things that are often irreversible. Who wants to be in line for a liver transplant, for a kidney transplant, or a heart transplant, or, you know, or a lung transplant? Unless you're some high-up guy like Dick Cheney, you're going to be waiting for a while. Um, and sometimes, you know, rich people have to go abroad to end up getting transplants. And let's not even go there if you look at the, uh, you know, the black market of transplantology. Uh, but you are relying on your doctor to give you advice. You know, you're a lay person. So if your doctor is too lazy for the amount of money that he's being paid to take out a warning label and go through it with you with the potential negative side effects, he's done you an injustice. So he doesn't tell you about the negative side effects that are already on the warning label. And you take the drug and you come down with those complications. You can't sue the drug manufacturer because you've already been warned, right? You may be able to sue your physician if you can show that he utterly failed in obtaining your informed consent. The other type of medical malpractice we see is at the time of prescription, not getting a patient's full medical history, uh, or doing all the testing to sh make sure that there are no factors that would counterindicate the prescription of a drug. In other words, if there are factors that are uh, against prescribing a particular drug, then you, you better know them and you better ask them. You know, we often see that with patients who have suffer you know, serious medical complications from sulfur-based antibiotics. Steven Johnson syndrome, uh, 10. That's uh, basically, you know, people's skin gets burnt off from a severe allergic reaction. You're scarred for life if you make it through. Liver damage, kidney damage. Uh, and then many of the things could have been avoided had the doctors had that, asked that question. Another issue that comes up is Often, for most medical conditions, you have a number of drugs that can be prescribed. So it's the doctor's duty when, after they finish their evaluation of the patient, uh, get their medical history, look at all these different factors, to prescribe probably right, the most benign drug that causes the least side effects. Why would you prescribe a drug that has higher statistics for more serious side effects? Doesn't make sense. Or let's say you prescribe an excessive dosage. Or a doctor knows that a drug is known to cause a particular side effect and therefore the patient should be closely monitored within the first number of days of taking the drug, if not within the first number of hours. What if the doctor fails to do that? In other words, improper monitoring of the patient. Or we get cases when patients already start to exhibit initial signs of serious side effects. Uh, and the doctors never pick up on it. And I'm not talking about just physical signs, but often, you know, the blood work shows it. Laboratory testing, other diagnostics are starting to show that a patient is exhibiting particular medical conditions that can be attributed to the drug. In other words, what should have the doctor have done immediately? Either discontinue the drug or reduce the dosage or take another remedial measures to minimize the damage. And if the doctor doesn't do it, then here we have another case where the doctor is not adhering to the generally accepted local standard of care. And they should be. So these are all the things we'll look at. But in order for my law offices to figure out whether you have a viable product liability claim against the drug manufacturer for failing to adequately and accurately warn of a particular condition. By the way, we also get a case against drug manufacturers uh, over manufacturing defects, where you can have a bad batch of a drug being manufactured, where the formula isn't right, where the drug is contaminated with other chemicals or drugs that are being produced at that particular pharmaceutical manufacturing facility. So in order, for, in order for us to figure out whether you have a dangerous drug claim, product liability claim against the drug manufacturer, and whether it can be asserted for all those uh, 
reasons that we discussed earlier, including you know, within the statute of limitations, or is it a generic, is it a brand name, you know, what state are you in, things like that. Or whether you have a medical malpractice claim, uh, what we really have to do is, this is an indetermination that we can make just by speaking to you over the phone. Uh, we have to review your medical records. So our suggestion is get all your medical records from, you know, depending on what happened to you, you know, a certain number of years back, the very least from the medical care provider who prescribed to you the drug or used a particular or installed a medical device, medical records from any other medical facility that treated potential complications or side effects, get your pharmacy printouts. If it's a medical device, try to get the medical device label because it'll have the serial number, the batch number, things like that. And we'll have to review all that and then we'll also have to interview you and then we can make a determination whether there, you may have a viable claim. But that's time consuming, so my law offices charge a flat medical review, medical record review fee. So I could review that along with my colleagues, and medical experts, doctors, stuff like that. Uh, that's about it. That's the procedure. Uh, so if you've come across my law offices because you've taken a particular drug, or you have a particular medical condition, or you've been using a particular medical device, you know, we're also talking about devices like knee replacements, hip implants, uh, medical devices, uh, meshes, uh, netting, all sorts of stuff that's used within the body, right? Pacemakers, other things. Uh, if you've called my law office, then the first thing you need to do is start getting your medical records. Even if you end up not having a viable claim, either against the drug manufacturer or against the medical care providers for medical malpractice, in the very least, you'll know exactly what care you received and what was done to you. And that's extremely important because look at today's statistics. Um, when you look at deaths from prescription drugs, 100,000 per year in the US. Not even talking about the opioid stuff. That's another guy, that's probably another 100,000. Uh, injuries from medical mistakes, close to 900,000 per year. In a country of 350, uh, 330, 350 million, wow, it's like one out of 350 people almost yearly on an annual basis becomes a victim of a medical mistake and gets injured. So all that should make you cautious and uh, what you really want to do is get all your stuff, get all your medical history so you know exactly all the drugs that you've been prescribed. And, and it's important to get the pharmacy records too because the pharmacy records will tell us exactly the drug, brand name or generic, the line number, the prescribing physician, the dosage information, things like that. Uh, get all these records, submit them to us. We will know exactly what was done to you uh, and we can go over that with you. And in the future, uh, you're going to be a more cautious, more prudent patient. And the next time you go to a doctor's office, the doctor says, well, Jim, here's a drug that I think you should have. And you're going to go, well, doctor, can you please print out the warning label right now and go through with me uh, all the potential side effects? Because I'd like to be fully informed. And can you also tell me about what other drug options are available? Perhaps safer options, right? So now you're acting like an informed consumer, an informed patient. And the reason why we have to do all this, is, well, there are a number of reasons. I, I'll still say the primary reason is the pharmaceutical industry and the pharmaceutical lobby. This is the current number one source of information for doctors. Uh, drug company sales reps, they go into their offices, bring them free lunches, bring them tr trinkets, you've all seen those pens, you know, calendars, things like that. Then they monitor the number of prescriptions. 
They invite doctors for retreats at different, you know, golf clubs, country clubs, resorts. And I guess if you prescribe enough, they'll go, well, you must really understand the drug. Maybe you should give a speech about, you know, how effective this drug is. And now not only are you getting, you know, a free trip to a resort, but you're also getting a speaking fee. So those drug company sales reps and that type of interaction with doctors obviously are not taking the time to discuss the negative side effects of the drugs they're pushing. That's a problem. And this already starts in medical schools. If you read different medical school histories and documentaries on this issue, you'll see that major pharmaceutical concerns started to make inroads into the medical education industry by funding medical schools, by giving them grants, and by pushing the medical curriculum toward prescription drugs. It's good business. Uh, but that, as we've said, compromises the independence and the competence and the loyalty of doctors, because they should be loyal to you as the patient. Instead, they're getting spoon-fed all this stuff for medical school uh, by the pharmaceutical industry and, and their lobbying power. So this is where we are. So this is another reason why if something is going wrong to you, with you or your loved one, and you think you've been hurt, by a medical device or a prescription drug, then what you really want to do is get all your medical records. Uh, as I always tell my prospective clients and current clients, if someone gives you a hard time about getting your medical records, well, tell them it's your right as the patient. And if the doctors refuse to provide your medical records in a timely manner and com you know, the complete set, then you do have the right to uh, complain with the state medical board. That's every state you have a board that supervises and licenses physicians. Uh, there are exceptions. For instance, a psychiatric patient cannot just request a full copy of his file because knowing everything that the psychiatrist writes about it may not be in his best interest. So some of those records will only be provided to other physicians or to lawyers. Uh, if we have to get the medical records for you, we will have to charge you more for it because we will be charged for that by, by your doctors. We will have to pass on the costs and you'll have to prepay them. Uh, but regardless, it's still worth it to get all this information so you know exactly what happened to you. And I'm sorry this is a long video. I think I've already talked about 27 minutes. But I, I'd rather make this video once than have to explain it over the phone to each person, you know, on a daily basis, or have my staff to do the same. Now, uh, in terms of getting us medical records, so we get medical records from all over the country on a you know, weekly basis, send them to us in electronic form, get them scanned, send them by email. If necessary, make photos on your smartphone, email them. Don't send us paper records. If you send us paper records, we have to charge you a scanning fee. Don't send us any originals because we don't keep these original paper records. After we scan them, we throw them away. So only if you have no choice, you know, if, you're, if you can't send them to us electronically by fax or by email or by instant messenger, and you have to send us paper copies, then make sure these are photocopies that you're not going to need anymore because you're not going to get them back and we will have to pre charge you for scanning them before we start evaluating everything. Um, how long does the process take? Usually it takes us two to three weeks once we receive your medical records to go through them, uh, set up a time, talk to you, uh, see if we need anything else and give you our initial impression of what you may have. Now, if you do have a viable claim, either a medical malpractice claim or a dangerous drug claim, then these claims we handle with local co-counsel on a contingency fee basis, a success fee basis. In other words, we get a percentage of uh, whatever compensation is collected. If we don't collect anything for you, then we don't charge you anything for it. Uh, you have to keep in mind that these cases are never usually, uh, unless you're talking about a medical malpractice case, the Product liability dangerous drug claims are not prosecuted individually. 
just too expensive, too cost prohibitive. So you have to hire medical experts. And medical experts will easily charge you from $500 an hour and up for their time to issue a medical opinion and also for testimony or depositions in court. That gets very expensive. So this is why you know we'll only proceed with cases. If you have a good case, but we don't have the statistics there, we're talking about product liability cases for dangerous drugs, then you know, do, my office will do is we'll get in touch with other law firms, see who has other similar cases, and we'll just wait till we get enough of them to be able to prosecute them collectively in a bundle against the drug manufacturer in state court or in federal court. And that's how things are. Um, again, if you're a victim of a dangerous drug or a defective medical device or medical malpractice, uh, first of all, obviously you've got my sympathies. I'm sorry you went through this. You're not the only one. Don't blame yourself. Um, your chances are you're a regular lay person who relied on the advice and then the treatment options that were provided to you by doctors, who relied on drugs that were approved by the FDA, which is supposed to protect patients. But being Washington politics the way they are, a place like the FDA can also be a revolving door where people will leave and work for the drug industry, then come back to the FDA and I think that affects their objectivity and their loyalty to patients. Uh, but that's a different story. We can talk about that later. What can be done uh, to try to reform this system? In the meantime, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to contact us. Best thing to do is send emails. So we get too many phone calls, too many voicemail messages uh, from all over the country and from other countries as well. But first and foremost, start getting your medical records together and your pharmacy records together. And see if you, know, if you can afford for, to, for us to review everything, to see whether we can help you out. Thank you. Uh, best of luck and God bless you.